Perfect. So uh, today, uh, the goal for discussion is to set the stage for the rest of the semester. So in the rest of the semester, we are going to talk about attack detection and attack mitigation. So over the next uh, three lectures, so today, today's lecture and Friday's lecture, uh, I'll be the one presenting about some of the preliminary stuff related to cybersecurity uh, for autonomous systems. And then on uh, Monday, uh, somebody from the college uh, is going to come, Mike is going to come and talk to you about how he thinks about security of the entire building management system across OSU. Okay. <clears throat> So uh, in this particular, so the presentation is very long. Uh, I'm not going to be able to complete the presentation today. So I'll just cover whatever sections I can cover today and the rest of it will be covered on Friday. Uh, the presentation is already uploaded to uh, Carmen. So you should be able to download it from Carmen handout uh, and you will have the entire presentation there. Uh, in this particular presentation today and from, uh, on Friday, uh, we're going to talk about attacks on autonomous systems, things that have already been documented in news. So I'm getting all the information from the online sources for this. Uh, we understand the goals for cybersecurity. We understand what kind of malwares are used in order to attack uh, these systems. And then we'll discuss some emerging regulations to secure critical autonomous systems. Uh, many of these regulations are something that are very new, uh, that are in, in process of uh, getting implemented. So this is really something that is very, very uh, uh, cutting edge at this point of time. And uh, the next generation of devices that are going to come out, whether it's a vehicle, whether it's a medical device, whether it's a, a critical infrastructure system, they need to be able to meet the regulations. So, uh, so something to keep in mind that regulations is what is driving a lot of the advances in uh, cybersecurity. So let's first talk about some of the recent attacks that have been uh, uh, launched on critical infrastructure systems. So there's a whole bunch of news articles and you can find these news articles online. So uh, currently US, so this is the article for, from June 29, 2024. Uh, US wants to integrate commercial space industry with its military to prevent cyber attacks. These are the cyber attacks on commercial space air, uh, satellites, so, okay? So that's something that uh, US is actively working on. Hackers, so these are ethical hackers, by the way, these are not uh, malicious actors, but hackers take control of government-owned satellites in an alarming experiment. Uh, this was done uh, from the European Space Agency, so these hackers were associated with uh, uh, European uh, space agency, they, may, they might have been hired by European Space Agency. Uh, the ESA maintained uh, the control of the satellite during the test. Uh, the researchers did not force the satellite to do any crazy tricks. Uh, however, they were able to access the satellite control through its onboard system and use standard access rights to enter its control interface. So even though they did not really launch an attack on the, uh, by firing some of the rockets uh, within the satellites, uh, they were able to gain access to those uh, critical systems in order to maneuver the satellite. Uh, there are digital threats against US water, food, healthcare, and other vital sectors. And of course, uh, the government uh, of the United States is very active in trying to prevent some of these infrastructure hacks. Uh, Russia linked malware cut key to 600 Ukrainian buildings in uh, deep winter. This is a, a news article from July 23rd, 2024. So this is uh, not too long ago, two months back, this article came out. And basically uh, the idea there was that, the Rus that uh, some uh, uh, Russian cybersecurity hackers, they launched a malware which, uh, uh, which created a blackout type of situation in a bunch of buildings. Uh, hackers are also targeting water utilities. Uh, in fact, I'll show you a video, perhaps in today's class, uh, where uh, uh, the city of Arkansas water system, the sewage and the rest of the water filtration system, it was hacked on Sunday, so just three days back. Uh, so. 
you know, that's something that people are uh, trying to do actively. Uh, there was a radio hack that disrupted trains. Uh, essentially, 20 trains stopped in Poland. Uh, it wasn't really a cyber attack, but uh, it was using a radio equipment, which cost $30. They used the radio equipment and uh, caused them to perform, caused the trains to perform an emergency stop. So in all of these cases, uh, there is, of course, one layer of communication layer where you want to use encryption, decryption, use better software writing tools, and so on in order to prevent these attacks from happening. But the wider point I'm trying to make here is that attacks are not just about exfiltrating data. It can really lead to damages to the infrastructure system. And that's what we are trying to study in this particular class. How do we prevent those things from happening? Um, and how do we detect that such a thing is happening uh, due to a cyber attack? So I want to, uh, so you can think about, so we talked about satellite system, water system, we talked about uh, uh, trains and so on. Uh, basically, if you look at it from a high level point of view, a good abstraction is to think of them as a cyber physical system. So what is a cyber physical system? You have a physical system, but there is a cyber component to it. If you bought a, a, a car in 1905 or 1910, it was a completely mechanical system. It was a physical system. There was no cyber component to it. There was no electronics on that system. Uh, if you buy a car today, it is a cyber physical system. It has infotainment system. It has a lot of electronic controls. Um, uh, in addition to the usual mechanical stuff that was there even in 1905 car. So there is an engine, uh, there is a wheel, and the wheels have sensors. And then there is an actuator, which is, uh, actuator is actually the engine and plant is the vehicle itself. Uh, so you can think of it as a, a system where you have the usual physical layer and you have the communication layer and then you have the control layer. Well, in the control layer, there is planning and estimation and detection and learning, all four things are happening. So this is something that happens on a computer. This is something that happens on a communication channel. So the communication channel could be wireless or the communication channel could be a wire, right? In, so in vehicle, the communication channel is typically wired, uh, but if, if, in the case of the satellite communication, the communication channel is actually radio waves or some sort of uh, uh, electromagnetic radiation uh, through which things are communicated. Okay, and these are all physical stuff. So actuator is like if, in the case of this building energy management, the actuator is some uh, some motor or uh, uh, some air handling unit above the ceiling. Uh, the plant is the room itself and the sensor is the thermostat sitting in the back. And of course, in the case of this, the sensor and this particular state is actually happening in this box right behind it, it's happening in the thermostat and that information is going to the actuator via a communication channel. So, uh, so depending on the system, the architecture of this particular stuff could be somewhat different. Uh, so in the case of thermostat, this part and this part is together, uh, where actuator is somewhere else, uh, maybe somewhere above the ceiling and the plant is the room itself. Okay, so in all these cyber physical systems, you have three essential things. You have the control system, you have the computing system, and you have the communication system. And all of these three things are susceptible to attack. Okay, so you can attack the control system. You can just directly send some commands to the air handling unit in this room to either pump in cold air or the pump in, uh, do not pump any air into the room. Uh, you can hack the computing system, which is the thermostat itself. And you can hack the communication system, which is the wire that goes from thermostat to the air handling unit. So you can, uh, you can attack any of these three uh, surfaces in order to uh, cause a damage to this particular room. Uh, some of the important examples of CPS security has been this uh, Stuxnet virus, uh, Maruchi water breach and the Jeep Cherokee. So we'll talk about Jeep Cherokee in a, in a while. Uh, but basically in Stuxnet, the idea was that uh, some hackers uh, launched a virus across the world on all Windows system. But basically that virus can only get activated if the virus is actually in Iran. And so Iran had a bunch of nuclear facilities uh, 
uh, and what this virus did was they were creating uh, they had a uh, water tree water facility which was supposed to be spinning and the virus actually started uh, making the it basically reduced the velocity of the spin and so originally people thought that maybe the, the that those uh, 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 machines have gone bad and so they ordered more machines and then of course those more machines were also slowing down in speed and they were not able to do the stuff that they wanted to do out of those machines and that's how the virus was discovered that okay it's not the problem with the actual hardware it's because of some virus on the computer which is reducing the speed of the rotational speed of those uh, uh, centrifuge uh, so that was the case uh, back in 2010 uh, this Maruchi water breach happened in Australia, uh, I think back in 1997 or 98. And one of the employees was uh, fired from the job for whatever reason. Uh, I don't know what the reason was, but that employee basically knew how the control system worked. So he was sitting at his home and he had the water system and he uh, uh, untreated sewage was, he basically opened the gate for untreated sewage to go into the river or something like that directly. And it was an environmental disaster of a huge proportion at that point of time because you don't want untreated sewage to go directly into the water body. Uh, so anyway, this was a disaster. So you can see that not every, like in this case, it was a disgruntled employee who actually caused the attack. Whereas in this case, it's uh, state actors who are launching a virus in order to uh, inhibit the uh, activities in some other country. Uh, we'll talk about Jeep Cherokee, but basically this particular car was hacked by uh, some uh, white hat hackers uh, who uh, wanted to demonstrate that the cars are very unsafe. Even though they are on the road, they are very unsafe from a cybersecurity perspective. So let's look at this uh, Jeep Cherokee hack. Are you crying? No. There's no crying in baseball or with the Capital One Venture Club. It's not fun to have your two-ton SUV's brakes hacked just as you're parking in front of a ditch. Okay, hold on tight. Hold on. Oh, That's what I've learned from Charlie Miller and Chris Valasek, a pair of hackers who have spent the last year developing a piece of software that can wirelessly sabotage this 2014 Jeep Cherokee. It hasn't been altered in any way. There are no devices attached to it. But like many thousands of Jeeps around the world, it can be remotely hacked over the internet through a cellular connection to its entertainment system that would allow someone to take over its steering, its transmission, and even its brakes. To demonstrate that, I'm going to act as today's crash test dummy and drive it on the highway here in St. Louis, while Charlie and Chris hijack its digital systems from Charlie's house miles away. They wouldn't tell me what they had plans, but they assured me that it wouldn't be anything life-threatening. Remember, Andy, no matter what happens, don't panic. It's not the first time I've driven a car while it's being attacked by these two hackers. But in 2013, oh they were in the back seat, and their laptops were wired into the vehicle through a port in its dashboard. <laughs> now they're sending the same sort of attacks remotely, and I have no idea what they might do. He's going as fast as I've seen him, right. so. So first we're gonna turn the fan on him. Yeah, let's turn the fan on, see if he even notices. All right, all the, something just turned on, all the fans and AC and stuff. I didn't do that. The trick started small. Oh my God. There's a picture of Charlie and Chris in tracksuits that just appeared on the dashboard. But as I drove down the interstate, things started getting unpleasant and very loud. Perfect. I can't turn it down. This is such a fun video. See, look, it got all the Oh, yeah. The air conditioning is blasting. The music is blasting. And I can't see anything because of the windshield wiper fluid. I'm gonna do it. He's not the one running the wiper. Kill the engine. It's been attacked. So we're killing the engine right now. It says park sense. Actually, can't accelerate. I stomped on the gas, but the Jeep slowed to a crawl. It says 43 miles an hour, but I'm not going that fast. I turned on my hazard lights, but I was still stuck in the right lane with no shoulder to escape onto. Guys, I'm stuck on the highway. What do you say? Oh, I think he's panicking. He's not going to be able to hear us with that radio. It's so loud. Guys, 
I need the accelerator to work again. The accelerator will work. It won't work. <laughs> You're doomed. Seriously, it's dangerous. I need to move. We, you gotta turn the car off. <laughs> okay. Now you should be good to go. <laughs> Semi drove by. All right, I'm gonna pull over because uh, I have PTSD. Charlie and Chris have only tested the full range of their attacks on a Jeep Cherokee. But they say that hundreds of thousands of late model Chrysler vehicles may be vulnerable through a feature called Uconnect, an internet connected computer in the dashboard known as its head unit. These cars, head units, expose a particular service that probably they, they didn't want to. Um, it lets you do things like query it for information like the GPS or the VIN or, or all sorts of other things, but it also lets you just run commands. So you have to first break into the car remotely over the cell network and then move laterally uh, if you want to do things like send CAN messages. And those are the messages that we can use to control things like steering or the windshield wipers or braking. They plan to release a portion of their exploit code at the annual Black Hat Hacker Conference next month. They've also alerted Chrysler, which is issuing a security patch. But they say a lot more needs to be done to protect a new generation of cars that are increasingly connected to the internet and potentially hackable. You guys basically brought, brought this car to a standstill while it was driving on the highway, which I may never forgive you for. <laughs> and uh, that was just like an experiment. What do you think is the worst case scenario? We wanted to point out, you know, to show that this attack is, has serious consequences for this vehicle. And so we did, you know, attack you. <laughs> but we, we did it in as safe a way as we could, so we, we didn't want you to get hurt, obviously. That's why we're working, is to make sure that we, we figure out vulnerabilities, weaknesses, get them fixed. We're only, we're only two guys with one car, right? So, you know, we can't look at every car, and we want to release this information because more people like us need to be focused on this problem. After their stunt on the highway, Chris and Charlie still wanted to show me a couple of other tricks. Below a certain <laughs> speed, they can control the Jeep steering as long as it's in reverse pop its locks, mess with the speedometer, and, of course, disable the brakes. Okay, hold on tight. Hold on. Oh, He's not getting out of that. I don't think so. Uh, uh, we're we're going to be doing some pushing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. That's, That's, that. That's, That's how you drive in the Midwest. Rocking. New Yorkers awesome. don't know how to do that. Okay, so the things that have happened since this, so this, was, this happened in 2015. Uh, so the thing that has happened since then is now the infotainment system is completely separate from the control of the car. So nobody can hack into the infotainment system, at least for 2016 onwards car if you buy it, most likely the infotainment is going to be separate from the rest of the control system of the car. So now if you want to hack the control system of the car, you have to be physically present inside the car to be able to hack it. Okay, so that has been an architecture change. So sometimes the idea, the when you see attacks like these, uh, you might think, oh, we need to have better algorithms, but sometimes it's just good to figure out the system design itself, like just design the system so that it is secure by design and you don't have to use algorithms on top of it. To make it. Uh, now, this is the, uh, this is the, uh, uh, the uh, Arkansas city water facility that was hit by cyber attack three days ago. Yes. But the recent cars have features which control the car from the HMI. Like it's not completely isolated to how they are. What, wait, what do you mean by HMI? The, the info OBD port? No, 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 the human machine interface, like the cluster. Okay, so uh, I see. Well, you know, the thing is that this particular area is still something that is evolving. So if you know, like SAE has come up with the cybersecurity standards for vehicle, which is, of course, undergoing changes every year. Uh, the original 2016 proposal is also there in your handout folder. So J6012 or whatever. So that's there in the handout folder So in Carmen. So you can take a look at that and see how they thought about cybersecurity back then. Uh, after this 2015 attack, they essentially came up with that cybersecurity uh, standards for the vehicle. And that has been updated in 2021. And I think that's been updated in 2024 again. So I don't know whether the cars are actually following those standards right now, or they will be following standards 2015, 2025 onwards, but that's something you need to figure out from individual manufacturers. So this hack happened three days ago, okay? Hi everyone, Sean Walman with Secure Cyber, and we have breaking news for Monday, September 23rd, 2024. 
The FBI and Homeland Security have announced today that as of yesterday, a water treatment facility in Arkansas City had been compromised by a cyber attack. The plant is currently operating in manual mode, and the city has advised that currently they are not seeing that any of the, uh, there's no danger to the water system in Arkansas City. So let's break this down just a little bit. How does a water treatment facility get compromised in a cyber attack? Let's talk through various examples. Number one, external access is not properly regulated. So what that means is the city uh, or the water treatment facility itself could possibly have some software out there that's that's on the network that is improperly exposing the water treatment plant to the internet itself. Uh, we saw this in the Oldsmar, Florida case where uh, something like TeamViewer was used to access the plant remotely. This could possibly be what's happened there. Number two, improper segmentation. What that means is possibly the city's network and the water treatment plant could have possibly had some bleed over where city resources could get to the water treatment facility itself. What we typically see is that there's a firewall and a big break between the city water treatment facility and the city network itself. And then we also see a firewall that it's needed to go between the water treatment facility itself and the control system. The third thing is they didn't have proper endpoint protection on the HMI system itself. The HMI system, and we'll probably have a graphic up, is the actual graphic interface that if an attacker was able to get access to that could make changes to the water system. They could change pump levels, they could change pressure, they could empty water towers, um, all those types of things. So th that is the worst case scenario uh, that an attacker would get access to that. So the fact that we see the plant in manual operation, what does that mean? That just means that they probably wanted to, as a precaution, take a lot of the control systems offline so that they could do an investigation to make sure that those systems weren't compromised. So we'll, we'll keep following this for you. Please like and subscribe the channel. Uh, as we get updates, we will put those out. But for right, right now. Okay, so, so as you can see, uh, these attacks are happening uh, everywhere and uh, the much of the stuff that you will see in public domain that people are talking about is on the architecture side of the things, not on the algorithm side of things. And that's because architecture is what people think normally. So whenever they think about cyber attack, they'll say, oh, there should be a firewall here. There should be um, the architecture should have been separated or something of, along those lines. And of course, sometimes those are uh, valid reasons to a uh, valid way of solving the problem, which is secure by design. So I create the hardware in a way that uh, they, it is secure uh, due to the, the way hardware is communicating with each other. Uh, but much of the work that we are talking about in the classes on the software side of things, which people generally don't talk about, but I think it's also an important part of uh, being able to secure some of these systems, especially because uh, the uh, especially because that's the last like uh, so uh, you of course want to prevent the uh, hacker to intrude into the system but if you fail in that particular attempt this is the last attempt like being able to write the software in a way that is secure against attack is the last uh, resort and then after that of course catastrophic uh, damages could happen so now I want to talk about how cybersecurity uh, folks uh, think about what the goals of uh, securing systems is. Uh, it doesn't really, what I'm going to talk about is things that people in cybersecurity talk about, and then we'll discuss very briefly why some of these things don't really influence the stuff that we are doing in this classroom. So these are the general security goals. Uh, uh, confidentiality, integrity, availability, authentication, access control, accountability, and non-deniability. So let's look at it one by one. What exactly is confidentiality? Uh, we want to prevent unauthorized access. So the university doesn't want you to be able to access my emails and me to be able to access your emails. So therefore we have password, we have duo authentication, we have SMS authentication and so on in order to retain confidentiality of the information that we possess. Um, Integrity means we want to prevent uh, corruption of data. So how do you generally prevent corruption of data? Well, you add error correcting code, you add redundant sensors. So if one of the sensor has failed, 
you can use other sensors to get the same information. Uh, so when, when I talk about uh, the rotation sensors at every wheel in the vehicle, that's a way to add redundancy. So all the wheels are probably rotating at the same rotational speed, but you still have four sensors measuring the four wheels because you want to add redundancy into your sensors uh, in order to prevent corruption of data. And then of course, there are uh, newer methods of uh, collating and making sense of information that is coming from the spirit sources in order to again prevent corruption of data. Uh, when, uh, when cybersecurity talks about uh, corruption of data, uh, they are really thinking about if I said two, then the two has to be recorded and two has to be recorded there forever, right? It cannot be corrupted. But when you think about it from a control systems perspective, you know, whether the velocity is 42 kilometers per hour or 42.1 kilometer per hour, it doesn't really matter that much. Okay, so uh, there is a difference between uh, like, even if you have a small error, that's completely fine, but you do not want to have very large errors in your data sets in the case of a control system. So that's where things are slightly different between what people think about it in this case and what we think about in the case of cyber physical systems. Availability means that there is timely and reliable access to and use of information for authorized users. So if my autonomous vehicle needs information from the speed sensor that the vehicle is moving at this speed every 100 milliseconds, uh, then that needs to be done, right? That needs that information needs to go to the autonomous driving algorithm. Uh, it has to be timely and it has to be reliable. And if in case it's not timely, so typically when information is not timely, then it means that there is some sort of attack that might be happening, which is preventing the information to go there in a timely fashion. Uh, in the case of this car hack video that we just saw, it was actually the availability issue that was creating a problem. So the authorized user, which is the driver sitting in the car, is not actually able to reliably uh, send information about the braking and about the acceleration to the actual actuator inside the vehicle. Authentication is something we are all familiar with. We want to verify identity. Uh, we have a lot of ways of identity, identity verification in today's world. Uh, you, we do biometric screening at the airport in order to do identity verification. We ask security questions. We have OTP and we have duo verification. These are all the things that we do on a day-to-day -day basis for authentication. Uh, access control is basically who can charge, change what. So we generally have this uh, admin manager, user privileges and so on uh, in order to make sure that the access is controlled. So for instance, if you look at Carmen, uh, I can change your score, a TA can change your score, but you cannot change your score, right? So that's an, that's an example of an access control. Accountability is identifying who is at fault. So something bad has happened. Now I want to be able to figure out who was the person who caused this particular fault or what is the system, what, what happened in, within the system. Uh, in the case of water breach, now they are looking at network logs in order to identify who's the person who hacked the water system facility in, in Arkansas. And then non-deniability. Non-deniability is important. So let's say I, I did the analysis based on the network logs and I say, okay, you are the person who has uh, ha hacked this particular system. Then of course you will come back and say, oh, you know, I didn't do it, uh, which, is, uh, which is very normal. Uh, but then we need to be able to have a proof to show that, okay, this is your password was used at this particular point of time. And then this token was issued. And uh, with this token, this command went to the water treatment facility. And so therefore there is a proper trail of, uh, trail of logs, which says that your password led to this particular attack. So there has to be a non-deniability. Uh, typically you of course use data log and you also use third trusted third party services in order to be able to attribute action to the agent after the event has happened. But it turns out that for control systems or for cyber physical systems, uh, information security is not enough, uh, especially because there are stringent deadline requirements for information transfer. So if you look at a vehicle, uh, I don't know how many of you will go into the vehicle industry, but there is a requirement that the sensor reading has to go to the actuator or to the controller or to the ECU uh, within a certain number of milliseconds. Some, some information needs to go every 10 milliseconds, 
some information needs to go every 100 milliseconds, some information needs to go every 500 milliseconds and so on. So there are stringent deadline requirements for this information transfer. So you can't really go around the uh, uh, encrypting and decrypting all that information because then you are uh, you will add more processing uh, uh, timeline within that communication and you are going to miss the deadline requirement. So that's why you can't really use any of these heavy weight software tools in order to uh, in order to secure the communication. And then you have external sensors that may be susceptible to attack. So in the previous offering of this course in 2021, we had about 20 students in the class, out of which 10 talked about different ways of attacking autonomous vehicles. And one of the most common way was GPS spoofing, uh, radar spoofing, and the uh, LIDAR spoofing. All three are very critical sensors, all of which is gathering information from outside the vehicle and uh, those are all susceptible to attacks as well. Uh, the other thing that uh, I think uh, uh, something that people don't generally think about, we are not really, so each cyber physical system has a signature. By signature, what I mean is, how is the state changing of that particular system? So if you look at a vehicle, uh, we cannot go from zero miles per hour to 70 miles per hour within two seconds or within three seconds. Right? So there is a specific dynamic behavior, dynamical behavior of the vehicle and we can use that dynamical behavior to actually uh, come up with the signature of the cyber physical system and try to detect whether the signature actually meets the signature of an authentic, app, authentic uh, operation or uh, it could be due to an attack. Okay, so we want to exploit the signature of the CPS itself to be able to detect an attack. And that is something that's not there in the context of uh, um, the information security world. So this is something that's completely new to cyber physical systems itself. And of course, we also need to have a comprehensive understanding of system design, hardware security, software security, attack mitigation algorithms to meet all the requirements for uh, security. Any questions so far? on this particular slide. Have any of you seen this information security goals before in any of the other courses? No? Okay. So let's look at what are the different types of malwares that are used in order to attack the systems. This is just to give you an idea. We are of course not uh, going into the nitty gritties of how malwares are designed. Uh, but we'll try to understand exactly what different types of malwares are and how they propagate. So virus uh, is a piece of code that replicates, but it needs a host. So uh, I could have a Word file, Microsoft Word file, and I could embed a virus in that Microsoft Word. And now whenever that Word file moves from one computer to another, somebody opens that Microsoft Word file and the virus gets spread onto the system. So it needs a host, the virus needs a host in order to spread. Worms are computer programs that do not require a host. So worms would just, uh, if I, uh, for instance, if I launch a worm on the building management system, for instance, it just automatically propagates without necessarily somebody opening a file. Okay, so those computer programs are known as worms. Uh, so as long as every computer that is connected to the network will have a copy of that particular piece of code and that is because the worms propagate on its own. They don't need a host. They don't need a Microsoft Word file in order to uh, move from one computer to another. Then uh, Trojans basically are piece of code that look at the current software that are running on the computer and then they create backdoors. So for instance, uh, I might have an Outlook open on my computer and a Trojan gets inside the Outlook and then it creates a backdoor so that uh, whatever I'm typing in the email, that information will go from my computer to the attacker's computer. So that is known as Trojan. So it will look at the current software that are on the computer and then it will host itself in one of the softwares and then it will create a backdoor so that someone can control that particular piece of software remotely. Key loggers, as is obvious, it logs the key input so it's somehow measure, uh, figures out exactly how to 
uh, figure out what people are typing on the computer. Uh, root kits are uh, used for <coughs> gaining administrative privileges to cause an attack. <coughs> so in the case of uh, uh, in the case of that satellite hack that we were talking about, uh, they were able to gain administrative privileges to the control system. Uh, and so something like that would be called if it is auto, if it is a piece of program that is spreading on its own, that would be called as a root kit. <coughs> Backdoors are uh, experimental software features running on the system. So, <clears throat> you know, if you look at an iPhone or if you look at my Samsung phone or Google phone and so on, these phones have been developed for, I don't know, 10 plus years. And so somebody in the first version of the software might have written a piece of code that may be uh, uh, not malicious, but at that point of time, the security was not as advanced. So they wrote a piece of code. And that code is still carried forward in the next version of the software and the next version of the software. So now I have, let's say, iPhone 15. Uh, but iPhone 15 may have a bunch of code from iPhone 1. And that piece of code may not be, uh, uh, may not have all the security features, may not have all the bells and whistles that iPhone 15, other features of iPhone 15 has. As a result of which, if you want to gain some privileges, you can gain it through that particular piece of code that was written in iPhone 1. So backdoors is basically something like that. So backdoor is basically some experimental software features that are running on the system. And as long as you know about that backdoor, you can actually exploit it to gain access to the information. Uh, so not everyone, like of course, it's very hard for you to be able to discover backdoors on iPhone 15's operating system. But people who are very advanced, people who have seen this development over the last 15 years, they'll be able to do it much more easily because they know what happened in iPhone 1 and they know what's happening in iPhone 15 and they'll be able to discover it and then cause an attack. Uh, logic bomb is an attack. Uh, it, it's a piece of code which triggers an attack when some logic is true or a condition is satisfied. So if I, if I put in a virus on your car which says, if the velocity goes above 70 miles an hour, stop the vehicle. That's basically a logic bomb. And ransomware is, uh, uh, is what is most common in today's world. It basically encrypts the data of the computer, of the uh, data that is there in the computer of an organization. And it provides the decryption key only when the money is paid. Typically, the money is paid in Bitcoin. In the last year, 2023, uh, the ransomware payments were about $1.1 billion. So it's a very big industry now. And there are lots of very, I would say, uh, profitable companies, security companies in the US who are helping some of the companies that are hit by ransomware. So if you want to make a lot of money, uh, you know, that's the way to go, which is become a security researcher who is going to uh, uh, help company recover, uh, like get around this decryption key requirement or come up with software system so that nobody can launch a ransomware attack against that particular company. So typical uh, companies on which ransomware attacks have happened uh, predominantly are medical uh, hospitals, you know, something like a cancer center here, you know, so something like that will is a very ideal place for hackers to uh, cause uh, to, to uh, go for a ransomware attack purely because it's a safety critical system. So hospitals are very, very eager to pay the money, get the decryption key and start working normally again. Otherwise, some patients might die and uh, and that would be very bad. So how do we, uh, so now that we understand uh, what are the attacks on control systems and what are the typical modes through which control systems can get attacked, let's try to understand what the, uh, <coughs> what's the steps are for securing, so I, I want to stop here for question because if there are no questions, I want to see how many slides do I have more. Yeah, I have a few slides Yeah, Any questions so far? No? Okay. 
So what are the steps for designing uh, subsystems so that uh, it is secure? So remember this particular uh, figure where we talked about how in cyber physical systems one could attack the control loop, the com computing infrastructure or the communication infrastructure. <clears throat> so here is how to think about an individual subsystem. So by individual subsystem, I'm talking about adaptive cruise control. So I'm not talking about the entire vehicle. I'm just talking about one specific feature within the vehicle. So one feature could be adaptive cruise control. One feature could be lane keeping assist. One feature could be uh, air conditioning, heating and ventilation system, air conditioning system within the vehicle. So we identify one such subsystem and we want to figure out, okay, how do we uh, prevent attacks from happening? So of course, I'm assuming that you have done all the software, all the hardware based uh, uh, design in order to make sure that the system is going to be secure. Now you just want to make sure that you write your control logic in a way that in case of an attack, uh, you are able to detect it and you are able to mitigate it. So we are looking at say lane keeping assist as an example. So you have uh, the entire control loop where plant is basically a vehicle and there is something happening in the loop in order to uh, uh, make sure that uh, the car is driving within the lane, within the two white lines. <clears throat> so you have to figure out what are the attacks going to be on the controller, on the communication link and on the computing link. Uh, then you have to run what is known as an anomaly detection algorithm. And uh, and so in anomaly detection algorithm, uh, you could have two different types of anomaly detection algorithms. So these are the algorithms we'll be talking about in the subsequent classes. Uh, one is a passive anomaly detection and the other one is active anomaly detection. So in passive anomaly detection, you are controlling the way you are controlling. You don't change your control action. You don't change your policy. <coughs> you are controlling the way uh, things are. And then you utilize the system knowledge to figure out if there is an attack happening or not happening. In the active detection, uh, you actually influence the control strategy. So imagine this following situation that you are trying to steer the vehicle and the steering is not working. Okay. Now, uh, one option is you just keep, the, so, so the road is curvy. So you just keep uh, driving on the road and you are checking whether you are able to keep yourself within the center of the lane or not. So that would be passive. The other one is active where you are actively driving the vehicle, even if the lane is straight, you're actively moving uh, the, uh, the steering left and right in order to make sure that you are always in control of the vehicle. Okay, so that is an active anomaly detection. So you're actively changing the control action in order to detect if something bad is happening to the system or not. Then there is causal identification, which is uh, whatever observation, whatever anomalies you are discovering, is it because of a disturbance, is it because of a fault, or is it because of an attack? So if I'm feeling very hot inside this room, there could be three situations. One is there are too many people in the room. The room is handling, room is supposed to handle 15 people, but the room is handling 40 people, as a result of which I'm hot in the room. Uh, so that is a disturbance, or it could be a fault which means that the air handling unit has gone bad or the temperature sensor has gone bad as a result of which uh, uh, the system is not working or it could be an attack wherein somebody actively is preventing the cold air to flowing from flowing inside this room. So that causal identification needs to be done again based on data and then you need to come up with a response which is how are you going to respond to the attack that you are seeing on the system. And of course, there could be different types of attacks uh, that could happen on this system. So I'll just go over it. Uh, so eavesdropping attack just means that you are listening to the information that is going on the communication channel. It could be sensor reading, it could be actuator reading. <coughs> going back to the uh, car example, the Jeep Cherokee example, the hack that was happening. Actually, those two researchers that you saw, saw the security researchers, they were actually eavesdropping on the communication inside the vehicle for several months to figure out what communication is used for braking action, what communication is used for uh, steering action, and so on and so forth. Okay, so eavesdropping is typically the first phase of the attack where you're just listening to what's happening inside the system. And then you do reverse engineering. Okay, so based on the data, you try to do reverse engineering. Uh, 
uh, here you are basically disclosing information about the system. What's the protocol we are using? How is the communication packet designed? What are the error correcting codes being used? All of that stuff is uh, disclosed in this particular phase. Then during the attack, you could have disruption where you are either jamming the signal or you are uh, launching a denial of service attack. There is a slight difference between the two. So in the jamming, what happens is there is an electromagnetic spectrum over which the communication is happening. And so you jam the electromagnetic spectrum with a very high amplitude noise. And then the authentic communication cannot happen on that particular uh, channel. So that's called jamming. <coughs> denial of service is slightly different. So you have a vehicle and the vehicle or you have a two systems that are talking to each other and a third system comes in and starts flooding that particular communication channel with a lot of requests. As a result of this, the authentic communication that was supposed to happen between the two subsystems are not happening. So that's known as a denial of service attack and that's a disruption attack. And then you can have a replay uh, zero dynamics and false data injection attack, which are spoofing attacks. So in this, what you do is you actually change the sensor reading itself uh, during the attack phase. So you might have seen, you know, movies like Ocean's Eleven and so on, where they will record the camera feed and they'll send the same feed again and again, right? In the while loop, they'll run that feed. So the, the people who are at the security are not able to see anything new happening in those, uh, in those locations. So that's uh, like a replay attack where you are you have some data stream, a time series data, and then you are basically re-looping re that particular data throughout time. And then false data injection is you actively inject wrong data. So if the sensor is saying 72, you actively put uh, 75, 76, or 77 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, so that's a false data injection and zero dynamics is basically, uh, you are sending some specific trajectory of the, uh, system under some control action and uh, so the the so uh, you have the dynamical model of the system and you basically simulate the dynamical model of the system and you send that particular information uh, as the spoof data that is injected into the stream so that's a zero dynamics attack looks like I'll be able to complete it. So, uh, so that's, so those are the different attacks and uh, we'll talk about how to design a normally detection algorithm and how to design the control response under each of these attack domains. So we are not going to look at this because this is mainly related to the, the usual cyber security, uh, which is have firewalls, make sure things are encrypted, this and that. So that's this part, it doesn't concern us these are the things that concern us and then if this kind of attack is happening how do you detect it and how do you respond to it is what we will be studying in the rest of this class and we'll use both the control design part as well as the statistics part in order to be able to do the anomaly detection as well as the response <clears throat> now what is happening broadly in the regulation sector so the, so whenever you think about an attack uh, of course, the precursor to the attack has been fault. So I have a system, sometimes things break and we want to make sure that the system responds in a, uh, in a manner that is uh, <coughs> maintaining the safety and security of the op operators who are around that system. So what they do is they come up with severity classes. Uh, in the case of this is the, for the case of vehicle, fault detection for vehicles. It's known as EVITA severity classes. And they try to figure out what the class of a particular fault is in terms of safety, privacy, financial, and operational uh, situation. Uh, so these are the four different parameters they look at. And if, uh, if something is severe, if a fault leads to a severe repercussions to any of these four things, then they want to make sure that that particular fault is, is uh, controlled in a way that uh, leads to a desirable behavior of the system. So one example is, let's say you are driving. So this has ha actually happened with me. So a truck was driving and I was driving right next to the truck on a highway. So we were around 70, 75 miles an hour speed. And one of the tires of the truck uh, burst uh, while it was in motion. 
And guess what the truck's behavior was at the time, like at the moment the tire burst, what was the truck's behavior? The truck was actually moving sideways, okay? Because it was at 75 miles an hour and one of the tires burst. And I was driving right next to it, right? So technically the truck could have collided with my vehicle um, in, at that particular point of time. But the good thing was because of the functional safety requirements, even though the truck was swerving left and right, it wasn't swerving so badly that it's going to come and hit the car in the other lane. Okay, so those kind of things falls under this sort of like if the tire burst, that's a fault, and that fault could lead to fatal injuries for multiple vehicles or uh, some heavy losses and so on and so forth. So then they figure out, okay, if the tire burst exactly, how is the truck control system going to respond to this particular tire burst and so? They make sure that those control logic is embedded within the truck. So it detects that the tire has burst and then it starts controlling the truck, assuming that there is no air in one of the tires of the truck. <clears throat> so that's what is meant by uh, understanding the fault and figuring out how to control the system under that fault. So now the new security protocols that are coming out uh, for cyber security of vehicles uh, they'll have similar severity classes and then they will talk about how to design the system in a way that if this attack happens, then this is what the vehicle should do. If that attack happens, then that is what the vehicle is supposed to do. <clears throat> so this is the uh, SAE 21434. So this is for road vehicles, the cyber security engineering part. So this is the functional safety document for uh, for attack, attacks on vehicles. Uh, this particular PDF is there in the Carmen, so feel free to take a look at it to understand how people are thinking about it. Uh, it's a very short document though. Uh, I'm sure these are things that are emerging, so you will see a much more longer document in the future about this. And then right now the uh, uh, FDA is trying to come up with uh, uh, the functional safety requirements for connected medical devices. So connected medical devices are many of the devices you see in the emergency, in the ICUs. Uh, so they want to come up with a safety standard for those medical equipment. Uh, and then this is something that is ongoing. So this is like the news is from this year itself. Uh, people are actively thinking about it and hopefully in a couple of years, we will have cyber security standards for medical devices as well. So I think that's all I have. Uh, happy to take questions, but I think we are out of time. So we can also take those questions offline. Uh, this uh, PDF, this sorry, this presentation is already there in Carmen. All the documents that I alluded to are there on Carmen. So please take a look at it. Let me know if you have any questions. Thank you. Thank <clears> you. <throat>